On behalf of the Tredegar Society, <clears throat> it is my great honor to welcome you to the American Civil War Museum on this, the first night of our 2015 education series. This series is brought to you in part by a generous contribution from the law firm of Hunton & Williams. Since its founding in Richmond in 1901, Hunton & Williams has grown to more than 800 attorneys in 19 offices in North America, Europe, and Asia, and represents clients across the full spectrum of industries that make up today's global economy. In addition, last year, every single lawyer at Hunt and Williams participated in pro bono service. As a firm, they contribute more than 50,000 hours each year to community service and charitable projects, including many hours of service to this museum. We thank them for their support of this museum and the speaker series. And we are in for a treat tonight with a true Richmond story from a true Richmond celebrity. Harry Kolatz Jr. graduated from VCU in 1986, developed a passion for writing and performing with local improv groups and in early American theater in Colonial Williamsburg, and ultimately took a job as a staff writer for Richmond Magazine in 1992. And if you will believe my internet research, during that period, he's covered uh, a very wide variety of subjects in his um, various columns for, for that magazine, including, quote, tuberculosis, Edgar Allan Poe and John Marshall. And I couldn't tell, was that the same article? No, Two articles. <laughs> Unsolved crimes, business and commercial enterprises of all shapes and sizes, artists across every discipline and history. Um, and as you, many of you know, in addition uh, to, to these major features, he also blogs as The Hat, and you'll see why shortly. <laughs> his first book, True uh, Richmond Stories, which was a collection of more than 40 of his past columns, was published in August of 2007 uh, and included a chapter on the subject that we, we get to hear about tonight. His second book, a narrative history called and the names are so good, I, I just I felt like I had to say it. Richmond in Ragtime, Socialists, Suffragists, su suffragists, Sex, and Murder, followed in 2008. And he's also written for a, a whole um, group of assorted theatrical pro uh, projects. Uh, in addition to this day job and these literary pursuits, Mr. Kolatz has served our community on many boards and civic organizations, including notably his long-standing long work on the annual Teresa Polak Prizes for Excellence in the Arts and his participation in the formation of the Old Firehouse Theater Project, um, where I believe he was married in 1996, his wife is here, and the new Fifth Wall Theater. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Harry the Hat. I like that, John Marshall and Edgar Allan Poe together. He's Chief Justice, he's a mystery writer. They're detectives, seen on Fox, it'll be great. <laughs> no, I wasn't married at the firehouse, although Amy felt like she was wed to it for a long time. Um, we were married in Scotland, uh, so, and a kilt, imagine that. <laughs> Pardon? Oh. Um, thank you for all being here, um, and I have to thank you to the Trinitor Society I have to admit that I was a little flabbergasted when I got asked to speak because you have a perfectly good library down there, you know, a bookstore, and also speakers who came before me and will go after me who have all these Latinate symbols behind them that speak to great education, and they've written big, thick books with footnotes and pedestals with opsit and ibid and my favorite, impassim. <laughs> I don't have any of that. I'm just a dirty-faced street, mus street musician, street historian. Um, and I have a column, a history column, um, in the book, in the magazine that I've been writing since 1993 called Flashback, where periodically I've dipped into our Civil War history, but the fact of the matter is, with all those books out there, there really isn't what new can I bring to it, and I have to ask myself every time when I write that. And I have written uh, significant pieces about various aspects of the war, particularly during uh, the sesquicentennial period, and I also got to learn how to pronounce sesquicentennial, <laughs> um, so, and educate other people how to say it. Uh, and I've been at Richmond Magazine so long that I've almost outlived print as a medium. So, <laughs> so thank you for recognizing the value of words. Dahlgren's Raid is why I'm here. And 
The story begins really with me going quite physically over the river and through the woods to my Goochland grandma's house. Uh, and there, there were markers, the near this site markers, if you all know them, 500 yards to the north, that kind of thing. And there was this big Dahlgren's raid. It sounded extremely dangerous and ominous. Of course, we're always going past them, and I never got to stop until I was in college <laughs> uh, to read them. We got to get there, this is my dad. And as uh, so we're going up Rebel Road, as my mother would say, to Grandma's house. And Dover Mills, that was a big thing. I, I, I'd going to see the ruins of Dover Mills, which are this jagged brick village. It looks very mysterious. And, and the name, Ulrich Dahlgren, it's like he strode out of that, you know, that series about the Vikings, you know? Ulrich, son of Dahlgren. And he was the son of Dahlgren, John A. Dahlgren, the admiral. And we probably, everyone, I just said that name, saw it and remember that picture of him standing with his big gun. Um, but that was his, his son. And then in, there was the cover of the 1975 science fiction novel, Dahlgren, with an H after the D, uh, by Samuel Delaney, featured a scorched ruined city with a big fireball. Uh, and the story is a very lengthy and complicated journey to and through Bologna, not the arsenal, but <laughs> named after uh, the, the, the goddess of the, the destroyer of cities. It's a fictional city in the American Midwest that is cut off by a catastrophe that is never really named. And William Gibson, who's one of my favorite novels, refers to Dahlgren as a riddle that was never meant to be solved. Likewise, Dahlgren's Raid. <laughs> All this conflated in my youthful imagination to conspire to create a Civil War episode of searing danger. And thus, stage right enters Judson Kilpatrick. A New Jersey Brigadier General who in early 1864 inveigles President Abraham Lincoln to end the Civil War with one bold stroke. How many times did we hear that? A historian describes Kilpatrick as though a hack writer had invented him. He was lantern-jawed and bushy sideburn, salacious, fond of prostitutes, <laughs> flamboyant, relentless in his ambitions and a combination of courageous and crazy. <laughs> his sobriquet was Kill Cavalry, which was not affectionate. <laughs> he didn't seem to care how many of his men or the enemies he killed. He also got a, sh a, sh a horse shot out from under him at Gettysburg, where on the third day he ordered a needless charge that got uh, General Elon Jell Farnsworth killed and therefore earned some enmity from the soldiers under which and the officers he served with. So by early 1864, Kilpatrick is searching around, he's sniffing around for something to restore himself a bit with what he perceives, of course, in his mind, as a master stroke. Uh, he'd been involved in a previous raid uh, that neared Richmond uh, in an attempt that failed uh, because two Union deserters warned the Confederates uh, that the Union cavalry was coming at Bottoms Bridge and they were turned away. Kilpatrick talked to whoever would listen about a strike on Richmond to free the estimated some 11,000 prisoners at Belle Isle and Libby and other, other dungeons, and so panic. And he felt that the city wasn't well defended. So this idea reaches the offices of President Lincoln, who then invites Kilpatrick to the White House on February 12, 1864, about six days after the last raid failed. Now, Lincoln appreciates boldness, even audacity, among his generals. And he knows Kilpatrick's history and his personality, but he wants an amnesty proclamation distributed uh, around the Richmond environs, hoping to induce the Confederates to surrender. Now, if Kilpatrick could free prisoners, all the better. Now, this is the part of the movie that we've all seen where they're in a desperate corner and the young guy comes up with this nutty idea, and the sergeant says, you know, that plan is crazy, but it's almost crazy enough to work. Well, this is where they are in the muddy mess of early 1864. This war has been going on. When did the, what they're thinking at this point, when did we never not have a war? We've been in this for so long, and so many have died, and so much has been destroyed. We want to end this thing. We want to end it. Uh, we want to end it any way we can. So, what does Abraham Lincoln do? 
he does what Abraham Lincoln does. He avoids military bureaucracy <laughs> by personally endorsing Kilpatrick's plan. And then Kilpatrick goes right next door to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton with this validation. Hey, look, the president said I could do this. Stanton sort of says, OK. And then, as one historian observes, Kilpatrick consulted with no one in the chain of command in obtaining the invitation. Lincoln likewise ignored the chain of command in issuing it. This plan is so crazy, it just might work. The Army of Potomac commander, General George Meade, disliked Kilpatrick's methods and him, but signed off on the plan saying he didn't want to know any details, you know, plausible deniability. <laughs> And since Lincoln and Stanton both approved, now remember, these guys are his bosses, so it's like, does it sound like a workplace thing? It sounds right to me. <laughs> they say it's okay. So now the thing lurches to life. Kilpatrick handpicked the 3,584 man force, which is basically now a black ops method. I mean, that's basically what this is. His secondary commander was the youngest colonel in the army, a 21-year-old Ulrich Dahlgren, scarred by war and using a prosthetic right leg uh, due to amputation after injury at the Battle of Hagerstown or Williamsport. Dahlgren was zealous as Kilpatrick and probably just as nutty, uh, but maybe not as smart. <clears throat> Stephen W. Sears says, he appeared unannounced at Kilpatrick's headquarters one day said he had heard there was going to be some big cavalry raid and told the general, I want to be in on it. He writes to his father, Dahlgren does, to the admiral, his father the admiral, that it will be the grandest thing on record. And if it fails, many of us will go up. I may be captured or I may be tumbled over, but it is an undertaking that if I were not in, I should be ashamed to show my face again. If we do not return, there is no better place to give up the ghost. Well, Kilpatrick's force crossed Eli's Ford on almost a straight march towards the city of Richmond. Now, meanwhile, Brigadier General George Armstrong Custer, that one, <laughs> undertook a faint maneuver into Albemarle County during February 28, March 1, captures a bunch of things, wrecks railroads, and does the things that Custer does. Kilpatrick crosses the Rapidan River and leads the main body from Spotsylvania towards Richmond while Dahlgren, leading 500 cavalry, rode to Goochland. Now, riding with uh, Dahlgren is a free black man by the name of Martin Robinson. Martin Robinson was employed by the Bureau of Army Intelligence. And Martin Robinson probably grew up around Goochland County, around Dover's Farm, around that area that he was going to end up trying to ford across. We'll get to that in due time. But he is guiding uh, these men all the way down uh, to the James River. Kilpatrick, on February 28, brushes aside forward pickets placed by Confederate General Wade Hampton. He of the wonderful beard. The next afternoon, Kilpatrick and his special operations unit reached Beaver Dam up station and fell to ripping up rails and destroying anything that they could get their hands on. Now, while engaged in this business, they don't stop a train from reaching Richmond. It goes by. Now, oh, look, there all those blue coats are ripping things up. Straight to Richmond, where they tell anyone that can hear the blue coats are coming. Now, Kilpatrick's plan called for his column to drop down on Richmond from the north, I'm saying get this right, <laughs> then Dahlgren to cross the James River from the south, break into the city, I'm trying to remember here, okay, <laughs> from the south, free the captives of, of uh, Belle Isle, and Kilpatrick will come down to Libby Prison. Everyone goes free. It's a bold plan, and unfortunately for Kilp Kilpatrick, too many moving parts, and it's wretched weather. Any of you who have been in Richmond in March knows what that's like. Yeah, exactly. An icy rainstorm pelted Kilpatrick and his riders as they approached the outside defensive works on March 1. Now, his troopers, despite all this mud and muck and rain and snow and ice, travel 60 miles in less than 35 hours. And they collide with intense fire 
put up by defenders scraped together by the commander of Richmond's Defense Forces, Major General Arnold Elsey Jones. <laughs> now, he's an interesting character, and I want to tarry here just a little bit because not many of you know probably about Arnold Elsey. His last name was really Jones, but after graduating from West Point, he started going by Elsey as it was more distinctive. On July 21, 1861, at the Battle of First Manassas, when his brigadier commander, E. Kirby Smith, fell wounded, Elsey became responsible for the entire brigade. He rose to the occasion and aided in repulsing the federal troops in a major engagement of the war. In a letter in, in the Richmond Times dispatched, General Beauregard <laughs> described rushing up to Elsey and proclaiming him the Blucher of the day. It sounded good if you knew who Blucher was, <laughs> the Prussian general who showed up to win Waterloo. But this was just the beginning, not the end. At the Battle of Gaines Mill on June 27, 1862, Elsey took a round of the head that didn't kill him, but rendered him unfit for field command. He'd married, before the, all the injuries, he'd married Ellen Irwin of Baltimore, and she, with their six daughters, almost from the beginning of the war, were trapped behind enemy lines in Norfolk. Elsey has a big round head, and he, when he was a kid, a really hot plate of oysters was spilled on his head, accidentally, <laughs> I think, and, uh, the, and it scorched his hair and it never grew back. At Port Republic, his horse was shot out from underneath him, and then came the wound at Gage's Mill. So he served distinguished in the long, and but he his invalid. So he's parked in Richmond defense, which he did when gunboats came up the river and, and the cavalry got too close. Robert E. Lee wrote one of the most uh, scathing letters in his own kind of Lee way, <laughs> saying that Elsie had not and done, very, done a very good job, but kept him on until this time. <laughs> but to defend the front of Richmond, Elsie put together at first about 500 men, it later grew up to be about 2,000. And these are boys, old guys, furloughed soldiers and clerks, about my age, uh, anybody who could carry a weapon, and five pieces of artillery which were fired with good aim. Uh, the firing was so intense that Kirkpatrick was convinced uh, that the regulars had reinforced the Richmond Home Guard and soon withdrew to a safer position. He recrossed the Chickahominy River at Mechanicsville with Hampton's cavalry in pursuit. I'm just thinking of Buford and the, the thing of the Gettysburg, he's the whole thing all over again. He recrossed the Chickahominy River at Mechanicsville with Hampton's cavalry in pursuit. Kirkpatrick fled to the Union lines at New Kent Courthouse and was back in Waynesburg by March 4. Dahlgren knew none of this. He thinks the plan is going just fine. He reaches Goochland on March 1. He split his forces. Captain John F. Mitchell with 100 men goes down to the James River's north bank to destroy canal locks and mills and push on to Richmond. Dahlgren secures additional horses from James Pleasant's barn while he was asleep. So James Pleasant's put on a Union jacket and one by one captured 14 of the raiders whom he turned over to authorities and a horse to replace the one that Dahlgren's men stole. <laughs> now, this is where things get a little messy due to recollection over time and easily embraceable mythology and preferential treatment for sentiment over facts. <laughs> right about here is where Dahlgren is within sight of three large estates lived in by fairly prominent Confederates. One of them is Sabbath Hill, uh, the home of Secretary of War James and Sally Seddon, uh, James Morrison's Dover. He marries, he's married to Sally's sister Ellen, and East one, Eastwood, excuse me, owned by Plumer Hobson, whose wife was the daughter of Governor Henry A. Wise. Wise, now a general, Brigadier General, uh, is, well, as governor, ordered slash allowed the hanging of John Brown. Uh, and Wise just happened to be visiting. This provided for Dahlgren, as we might say now, a target-rich environment. <laughs> uh, if any of these men had been home, in fact, Wise was there. But my question is, how did he know who was where? In fact, there's this, some discussion that he didn't actually know where Seddon was. He was just knocking on doors. Martin Robinson is from that area. I have a feeling he was telling him, he's here, he's there. But everything gets confused, as happens, particularly over the years when people are remembering things around 1906. <laughs> A Goochland soldier, one Gath Wright, on furlough, this is one of the stories, sent to Eastwood Plantation to warn Wise that he needed to leave, like right now. Why does he need to do that? Why, how does he know they're there? Um, I will get into that a little later. Wise is visiting his daughter, Annie Jennings Wise Hobson, 
and there would have been a very awkward meeting with Dahlgren that might have resulted in a similar conclusion as to what happened to John Brown and to another man in Dahlgren's service, whom I'll get to momentarily. Now, if I had pictures behind me, which I don't, you, this is all you get, I am AV, <laughs> uh, there'd be a Ken Burns swipe from bottom to top as Samuel Harris of the 5th Michigan Cavalry speaks. My company was directly opposite the house and not more than 100 feet from the front porch. It was a large, old-style Virginia mansion with a wide porch across the front and four large stone columns. Dover Plantation would be the first stop they'd make there. It's a big mansion, James and Ellen Bruce Morrison. Uh, now, he thinks, apparently, that this is Seddon's house, the Confederate Secretary of War. Seddon, who was in Richmond at the time of the raid, eh, I, my voice cracked, I'm 13, <laughs> in plantation across the fields from Dover. The Sabbath Hill is across the, across the fields. What happened or didn't happen isn't easy to reconstruct because all the women are credited with saving Richmond. Uh, again, <laughs> Louis Beaudry, chaplain, 5th New York Cavalry, in tones. <laughs> At Dover Mills, we halted about two hours on the property of Mr. Seddon, the rebel secretary of war. No Union troops had ever been there before, and our appearance created excitement. Well, I bet it did. <laughs> and Ellen Wisemayo. Dahlgren's original purpose is said to have been to cross the James River at either Judge Jude's Ferry, which was on the Morrison Place, above, just above, or at Man and Confederate, three miles below us, and to approach Richmond by the south bank of the James. Whether it was or not, his force entered the Morrison and Seddon plantations instead of coming straight into Eastwood, and there had considerable time firing buildings and appropriating horses. <laughs> A stone barn on the Morrison grounds and three fine stables with horses in them, according to some accounts, were burned that morning. And there was great consternation at these houses, all in plain view of each other. At this time, Morrison was conveniently out of town, touring his southern plantations, and his elder children left with their aunt at Sabbath Hill and allegedly heard the screams of the family's horses in the burning stables. My question is, if you're in a cavalry unit and you know there are horses and you need, you're going to try to free Bell, Bell Island prisoners, why are you burning a barn full of horses? Out of spite? Or are you just stupid? Anyway, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I don't know about that. But we do know that there was, there was destruction. They did burn things. Horrible as this is, a number of the troops found Morrison's wardrobe. This is we get to the point where it's like apocalypse now, and it's who's in charge? You're in charge, or the French plantation. They find Morrison's wardrobe replete with a variety of elegant toilettes, donned Mrs. Morrison's wedding gown and other costly, uh, costly feminine costumes. They formed a cotillion and danced all over the yard. Very strange period of this raid. After pounding on the door, at Sabbath Hill, he introduced himself as Colonel Dahlgren. Mrs. Seddon, it is said, asked him if he was related to Admiral John A. Dahlgren. When the response came that he was a son of the Admiral, the wife of the Confederate Secretary of War replied, your father was an old boy of mine in my girlhood days when I was a schoolmate of your mother's in Philadelphia. The Colonel at once doffed his hat and promised Mrs. Seddon protection, whoa, and then struck the chords and immunity from harm for herself and property. <laughs> I, she entreated the officer and his staff and gave her a tour, 26 rooms. Bring from the cellar some blackberry wine of the vintage 1844, and quickly the hostile invader was converted to a guest. I don't necessarily buy any of this. And I'll tell you why, because I think it's the other house. Similar credit is given to the women of Eastwood, Annie Jennings Wise Hobson and her sister Ellen, Ellen Wise Mayo, and I can really see them. So uh, and Annie is upstairs, you know, talking to the servants, so this is what you got to do, and getting, her, getting Mr. Wise out of the house, and uh, Ellen is in the front saying, oh, yeah, no, he's not here, he's in Charleston. Well, we don't know where he is. <laughs> and so uh, Henry Wise is doing this. <laughs> he's headed for the wood. Feet don't fill me now. That's what he's doing, and that's what he did. So, so he gets the credit because he flees. He gets credit for saving Richmond. Well, the girl, the women, get the credit for saving Richmond. And they probably did, I'm sure they delayed Dahlgren. But that train already left station, and it left it at Beaver Dam. And those guys got to Richmond before Henry Wise did. Uh, anyway, so we know something happened in Goochland. We're not, well, we know many things happened. Now, these little parlays, However they happened, or if they happened in this way, played out, as was recalled, accredited by having saved Richmond. What we do know 
is that Henry Wise's neck and probably his other parts were saved. <laughs> Thus, the steam mill at Dover was torched. The elegant remains left from this wartime destruction still stands 150 years later, and it's a pretty spooky place uh, towards dusk. Samuel Harris, Michigan Cavalry, 5th Regiment. Between the said mansion and the river was a large grist mill with a sawmill attached. These were driven by about a 100 horsepower steam engine. These mills were fired in several places. A few steps further, and we were on the bank of the James River Canal. Here we found two or three canal boats loaded with cornmeal and lumber from the mills we had just burned. These were all burned. A picket of Custis Lee's battalion is captured, and during the halt, the men have coffee and feed the horses on captured grain. Dahlgren, after this festival of destruction, now needs to adhere to the agenda and cross the river. The unit, as we know, was accompanied by Martin Robinson, and Martin Robinson knows this area and he knows the fords. Well, what no one had expected was the rain. The fords are washed away, and Dahlgren is impatient and angry and has a tendency of acting out. <clears throat> He suspects Robinson of treachery, takes his reins from his horse, and uses them to hang him on a tree right there by the river. And the body supposedly remains there suspended for several days. And what I don't know is when he was cut down and where he was taken. Back to good old Samuel Harris, Michigan Cavalry, 5th Regiment. I had my doubts then, and still have the same, whether this guide intentionally or treacherously misled us. Under the circumstances I considered then, and do now, that the guide done remarkably well to bring us out to within 15 miles of the point aimed in, at a, in a march of nearly 200 miles. Dahlgren denied the capture of the Secretary of War or Henry Wise and not finding a way to cross the river where the time is slipping away and thinking he's hearing Kilpatrick's guns in the distance strikes out toward Richmond on the north bank. Dahlgren swoops down upon the home and farm of Benjamin Green, and it's here that an assortment of boys and men in the militia stopped his advance near today's Country Club of Virginia at Three Chopton River Roads. A squadron of golf carts formed a defensive square, and <laughs> just trying to see if you're listening. <laughs> a portion of Dahlgren's command reached safety, but Dahlgren and some 100 of his men, lost in the dark, headed toward King and Queen County Courthouse. So he's, he gets boffed away from, and he goes over north, and he's, try, he's trying to, either trying to come from the east, he's lost, basically, because he does, doesn't have Martin Robinson anymore, and he doesn't know where he's going. On the night of March 2nd, near Walkerton, they ride into an ambush. Dahlgren is shot in the head and left to die uh, in the road. William Littlepage, William Littlepage, 13 years old. He's in the home car. He comes upon Dahlgren's body, and he frisks and searches his clothes, and he comes up with documents, or so the story goes. He comes up with documents and reads that in what is thought to be Dahlgren's hand, that the mission is to burn the hateful city and see Jeff Davis and Cabinet hanged. Now, Little Page passes the papers to his teacher, Edward Halbach, who, appalled, hands the paper further up, Fitzhugh Lee gets it, <laughs> and then they come ultimately to Jefferson Davis's desk. And Jefferson Davis reads these aloud, and when he gets to and Cabinet killed, turns to Judah Benjamin and says, I think they mean you. <laughs> the documents, thank you, little Benjamin, little, little Judah P. Benjamin Joe. Did not, well, I actually didn't say that. The documents made it into the Richmond newspapers where Dahlgren was denounced as Ulrich the Hun back to the Vikings. <laughs> Richmond newspapers described in gruesome detail. The examiner, his body was stripped, robbed of every valuable, the fingers cut off for the sake of the diamond rings that encircled them. It was a wedding ring. <laughs> when the body was found by those sent to take charge of it, it was lying in a field, stark naked, <laughs> with the exceptions of his stockings. Some humane person had lifted the corpse from the pike and thrown it into the field to save it from the hogs. The artificial leg worn by Dahlgren was removed and is now at General Elsie's headquarters. It is of most beautiful design and finish. Now, the weirdest thing in this whole narrative is describing Dahlgren's prosthetic leg as a beautiful design and finish. But <laughs> yesterday afternoon, the body was removed 
from the car that brought it to the York River Railroad Depot and given to the spot of earth selected to receive it. Where that spot is, no one but those concerned in its burial know or care to tell. The Richmond Whig, the body of Colonel Ulrich Dahlgren killed in the swamps of King and Queen by the 9th Virginia Cavalry, was brought to the city Sunday night and laid out at the York River Depot during the greater part of the day yesterday where large numbers of persons went to see it. It was in a pine box clothed in Confederate shirt and pants and shrouded in a Confederate blanket. The wooden leg had been removed by one of the soldiers. It was almost noticeable that the little finger of the left hand had been cut off. Dahlgren was a small man, thin, pale, and with red hair and a goatee of the same color. His face wore an expression of agony. About 2 o'clock p.m., the corpse was removed from the depot and hurled, and no one knows or is to know where. Well, guess what? So the body's public displayed. It's mutilated. Gets a really cursory burial at Oakwood Cemetery. And this gets to Elizabeth Van Loo, which is, a, am sure, just a huge, that's a huge story in and of itself. It ran a syndicate of spies. Uh, one of whom, at least, at least one, was probably in the Confederate White House. This gets into the whole situation of the good death of the Victorian times in the 19th century. This appalled Elizabeth Van Loo that his body should be so ill-treated. And so she arranged to have it exhumed and smuggled north. And um, I believe that uh, Ulrich Dahlgren is actually buried uh, in Pennsylvania uh, in a family plot. Now, as if the war hadn't yet killed off the chivalry of respectful combat, this incident did it. The Confederates hatched plans to, link, to, to kidnap Lincoln and blow up the White House. Now, the authenticity of the Dahlgren orders have been debated ever since, and I am not going to solve that question here today. <laughs> I can tell you what I know. But Secretary of War Stanton collected all the papers related to the raid, and in December of 1865, had France Lieber who was directing the preservation of Confederate documents, bring the raid documentation to him. And they've not been found since. What we do have, Meade and Kilpatrick publicly denied the accusations, but Meade privately thought that the whole affair was an ugly embarrassment. He wrote to his wife that considering Kilpatrick's reputation and other evidence in Meade's possession, that the orders were probably authentic. Now, what other evidence, and he had other evidence he said, and what that evidence was, we don't really know, except that we do know that Captain John McGinty, an intelligence officer traveling with Dahlgren, remarked to the Union Provost General Marshal, Messina Patrick, and Patrick wrote in his diary on March 12th, McGinty thinks the papers are correct, and they were found upon Dahlgren as they correspond with what Dahlgren told him, told McGinty. And Judah Benjamin had no problem with this whatsoever. He promptly sent the letters over to Europe as they were, they'd been photographed to the Confederate Commission there in Paris. And John Slidell with orders for Slidell to distribute these throughout Europe, which Slidell did, and in England. And the address was turned into a lithograph. By far, the staunchest critic or staunchest advocate of Dahlgren's innocence is his father, Admiral John A. Dahlgren, he acquired one of the lithographs made in England and noticed that his son's last name was spelled incorrectly. It was D-A-L-H-G-R-E-N. In an article in the New York Herald, the Admiral Prella declared the papers to be a forgery. And this is not the last word. Uh, there are others who investigate looking at the lithographs. They see that there's a bleed through of the ink. Jubal Early in 1879. There was another charmer. <laughs> they arise that the misspelling of the name came as a result of the bleed through. So this turns into this sort of, you know, who do you trust? Who's got the right evidence? And we don't have the papers because Stanton probably put them up the flue of his furnace. In the 1980s, historian J.O. Hall theorized that the transposition of the letters was due to the photographer's attempt to clean up this area. The lith lithography rattan to make this one document, he needed to clean it up a little bit. He needed to clean it up a little bit. In doing that, he doctored the signature without knowing it. Debate, as I said, still rages. Now let's face it. If we, as a nation, at one point passed exploding cigars to Castro, <laughs> or were OK with hunting Saddam Hussein down to a spider hole, then in 1864, his plan is so crazy it just might work. Well, 
it's very possible that we don't know who originated these orders. Was it Dalton acting on his own? Was it Kilpatrick? Did it go all the way up? We will never know that. But the fact of the matter is that in these desperate, dark days of early 1864, when again, it seemed like this war had never not been happening to most of those people involved in it, everyone wanted it to end. So this is part of the, the thing that we confront as the awesome power of people's willingness to do things they wouldn't do in peacetime, or they wouldn't do to their, to, well, it's a family feud, it's a family fight. Any of us have been involved in that, know that we're sometimes nasty, that those can get really nasty. And Jefferson Davis and the rebel cabinet weren't regarded as being particularly friendly parts of the family. Now, if they'd been recognized as a nation, which they weren't, these activities probably would have been against the rules. But this was a full-on, nasty civil war. And by the spring of 1864, it was a serious and deadly business as any conflict. Kill Calvary, kill Patrick. Gets transferred to the Western Theater of War. And the prisoners on Belle Isle are shipped to Andersonville. The Confederate ideas to sow terror behind lines at that, t at that, at that late part of the war uh, came to nothing, really. But one sympathizer involved in the abduction plot got his moment. His name was John Wilkes Booth. And that's Dahlgren's Raid. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Can answer a few questions. I don't know. Where'd my beer go? Uh, <laughs> drank it mysteriously. <clears throat> yes, any questions? I stunned you all. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Uh, you're closer, and then I'll get to you. Yes. Yes, he did. And saved Richmond. <laughs> he didn't save Richmond. He saved his neck, is what he saved. And uh, and you know, so they they dug him out in 1870 to try to settle the municipal split when the Reconstruction government occupied the. They split, and one side was in City Hall, and the other side was in the Main Street Market House. Did you know about that? And they dragged out Henry Wise, who looked like he was a corpse anyway. And ah, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. And then, uh, well, what a what a crazy character Henry Wise was in, in that particular. He was a unionist and. Ended up hanging John Brown. Yes, back there. That's a great point. But you know, hey, <laughs> I've got these orders. See, there's, and oh yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and so and so McGinty, the guy, you know, says, well, this is what Dahlgren told me he was going to do. Now, whether Dahlgren was just bluffing, it's like I'm going to burn that capital and we're going to kidnap Jeff Davis. He was trying to psych himself up to do this. Uh, he's 21 years old, 21, leading this thing. And you know, 21 then and 21 now is a little bit different, but still, I mean, he, uh, he was zealous, but he just wasn't experienced. Um, and Kilpatrick should have known better. But, and, he, and when he encountered resistance, he fled. And unfortunately, not telling Dog. Yes? Oh, yes. It's a good question. Uh, and obviously, you could see the river was flooded, uh, and, and Martin had got him there. And so, I would, what a terrible thing. You know, he's there. Look, I got you here. I can't help it. The river's flooded. He hangs him because he can, because he's crazy. I don't know. Yes, he was black. He was a free black working for the United States Army in concert to try to get Dahlgren to where he needed to go. And uh, what a horrible thing to occur there. And I, yeah, it's a good question. It's like the, the book Dahlgren, the Delaney. It's, it's a riddle that never will be solved. Uh, because I think that, that at this point, he was so frustrated, so angry, he'd missed out on getting the guys he thought he was there to get, or was he hoping to get. And he couldn't find a Ford. The plan was botched. And so he hanged a man. I mean, the logic doesn't really scan, but that's perhaps what he was thinking. I can't know what he was thinking. But yeah, that's how it went. Yes? Yeah, 
I've read this. Um, I've read one account where a few try to ford and drown. That also might have impelled him. Um, kind of seems, I mean, you know, these, I don't know why they would try that if they could obviously see the river was flooded. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I've, I have read that account. I think that's the one that appears in 1906 in the Memphis Commercial Appeal. And uh, it's, it's an as told to kind of thing. And they're mentioning that they, several of the troopers tried to ford the river and drowned. I, too much of that blackberry wine from 1844, the vintage, you know, they even knew the vintage. I kind of, I, I just, that's a crazy scene. And I could just, it, I, I that was just nutty. I, 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 yeah, I can't explain that. <laughs> that's soldiers having a good time <laughs> when they're paused in the middle of a demolition, destruction. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, um, uh, yeah, well, yes, <laughs> all of these things. Uh, there are a couple accounts of the, the, of the fellow from Michigan who actually wrote a small pamphlet that is at the Library of Virginia. Um, uh, the minister also, uh, the pastor also left an account. There are any number of newspaper accounts, um, most of them con contradictory. Um, some of them you've got to really wonder where they're getting these things from. Also, but it's the American Civil War, and strange things happen every day. <laughs> and so, but there's cre credibility and, and credulity that we have to wage this. Well, you know, and so, um, I, I, so there were there were the letters, uh, and, and and Stephen Sears and and the histories on the on the raid. Um, so I tried to incorporate them in a way that would be somewhat entertaining, uh, and informative. <laughs> so. Thank you, <laughs> unlike Goldwick. <laughs> Thank you.